The U.S. starts shipping out COVID vaccines abroad, an abortion case making its way to the Supreme Court, and Starbucks barista's biggest complaint is... Tuesday Needs to Know, let's go. Good morning, this is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Tuesday, May 18th, and Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hi, Carlo. Good morning, Jill. How are you on this beautiful <laughs> spring Tuesday? Uh, I'm okay. How's it going? It's going. I got my uh, my Tdap shot yesterday. Uh, did you get one of those before you were pregnant? I don't know what it is. Um, it's a vaccine for something that you're supposed to get, I guess, when you have a baby. This actually makes me feel look so stupid because I literally got a vaccine of something that I have no idea what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm basically I've gotten I've gotten more vaccines in the last like few weeks than I think I have probably in the last 35 years. I'm just like walking into CVS like, give me what you got. It was shingles. What do you have back there? Measles, <laughs> mumps, tetanus. Um, I don't know if I did. I think I probably, they test you for all of it um, yeah, when you're pregnant. Right. Okay, speaking of vaccines, President Biden says the government will be donating 20 million doses of the Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J shots. It's the first time the U.S. has dipped into its own approved vaccine su supply to send abroad. This is COVID cases have declined in all 50 states for the first time since the pandemic started. The fall off is particularly notable here in the Northeast. New York lifting some mask mandates uh, effective tomorrow. New Jersey is mandating that students return to classrooms in the fall. The um the vaccine diplomacy here, that's a big deal, I think. Uh, hopefully it's the start of an even bigger effort to really put a put an end to this this thing globally. You know, it's in our interest, Jill, you and I have, have been talking about this for months now, long before I think a lot of other uh, media outlets really got religion on this issue about sort of vaccine diplomacy. Um, it's, you know, it's in our interest to protect these poorer nations with our vaccines, um, not just be for sort of like the selfish, soft diplomacy reasons, but just because our vaccines are the gold standard. They're the best. They really are. I mean, if you look, um, Here's a little case study. Uh, if you look at Seychelles, right, that's the uh, our island chain in the Indian Ocean. Uh, they're the mo uh, technically speaking, they're the most vaccinated country on Earth, but they're having this really pretty notable new surge in cases now. 30% of people infected on that island uh, were given two doses of the Sinopharm vaccine, which is one of the Chinese vaccines that is not approved uh, here. Um, a similar trend happening in the country of Bahrain uh, in the uh, Arab world. They also use the Sinopharm vaccine. This is just to say that, you know, that vaccine, I'm sure, is better than nothing, but it is not, you know, as effective as a two dose Pfizer regimen, for instance. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't I hadn't heard that, Carlo. Yep. Um, good to good. Good to know that ours are working, um, but that's kind of scary, right. especially because we know that much of the world isn't going to be vaccinated with our with our vaccines. Yeah, 20 million is sort of a drop in the bucket, right? I mean, it's something. Um, one, before we go, just just uh, one other, before we move on, our national positivity rate, we're at 1.9%. So we're really starting to see this this thing fall off here. Um, the New York subway system, back open 24-7. That's no big deal if you don't live here. But if you do live here, that is a huge deal. New York City cannot come back until the subway comes back. Um, but I did a little test yesterday. I wanted to mention I uh, on my walk, I went into the local Starbucks over here. No mask. No, I just did not even on <laughs> not even on my chin. I took it off, put it in my pocket. Um, I felt Jill like, you know, that dream sometimes you have where you're like naked in your high school. Like that's the, that's how I felt in there. It was really notable. I was the only person not wearing a mask. Um, I definitely got a couple looks. I don't think the news that they had dropped their mask mandate sort of like made it to most people. Um, so I think it's definitely going to take a little bit. I think it's definitely going to take a little while for, for us to sort of, you know, get, I don't know what, get back to not wearing masks in public. Well, you, you, I think that, um, technically the local guidelines are still, they, they, they outweigh the, the CDC oh, did I break mandate the rules? or Starbucks. So in New York, it doesn't go effect until tomorrow. So technically, oh, so I think I, you broke so the I rules. So I was breaking the rules. Oh, okay. Well, that would explain some of the looks I got. 
Um, but you know, so. the grocery store workers, their union has come out to say that they're they're against lifting the mask mandates, and I understand that because a lot of people aren't. We know a lot of people aren't vaccinated, and if you're if you go to a supermarket, I, I guarantee you, um, <laughs> if they lift when they lift the mask mandate no one's going to be wearing a mask. The, the, the people who aren't vaccinated aren't going to be like, you know what, okay, I'm going to wear, th-. I mean, maybe they will. If you're unvaccinated right. and you're still going to wear a mask, I'd love to tell us about it, but it's, mm-hmm. I would guarantee you just no one's, you're not going to see any, anyone in a mask. But the, the CDC has said, if you are vaccinated, you're fine. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, I think that's sort of the, the, the main point, and that was sort of the point of my, my Starbucks, my illegal Starbucks test yesterday, um, which is just to, you know, to, to get into this mindset that, like, if you're vaccinated, it doesn't really matter if everyone around you isn't vaccinated, right? That's the point, sort of the point of the vaccines. I know it's sort of like, you know, I know there's, a, there's, a, there's some risk of breakthrough cases, but more or less, you're good. So, but look, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have no desire to like cast aspersions on people who want to wear masks for the rest of their lives for all I care. It doesn't matter to me. Um, do whatever, you know, do whatever makes you feel comfortable. I just thought it was sort of interesting to the, the feeling that I got of like that real sort of sense of vulnerability, not wearing a mask inside a store. Such a rebel, Carlo. Yeah. I love it. Me. I love it. Um, All right. President Biden now expressing support for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas for the first time, while also stressing Israel's right to self-defense. Biden discussed the ceasefire with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu after the U.N. Security Council met for the first time, but made no progress on ending the conflict. General Mark Milley, the top U.S. military commander, says he is worried that the fighting is risking a broader destabilization of the region if it continues for a lot longer. Meanwhile, Israel and Hamas continue to trade fire uh, with no signs of stopping. Tom, Tom Friedman in the uh, New York Times, he wrote a column, I think it was yesterday, it may have been Sunday, but I think it was yesterday, uh, that I, I thought was pretty good. You know, I have a very complicated relationship with Thomas Friedman. Like, he's been writing sort of the same two or three columns since I started <laughs> <laughs> A relationship (laughs) usually implies that the other person's aware of the relationship, but all good. (laughs) <laughs> Fair point. Uh, yes, friend of the pod, uh, Thomas Friedman. No, he's been writing like the same two columns, you know, since I started reading him back in high school. But I always read him on Israel. I think that he always has really interesting insights on um, the Israeli conflict. Uh, so this column that um, he wrote yesterday or the day before was talking about how Israel was really on the precipice of forming its first national unity government right before this spate of violence just a couple weeks ago, which would have included Jews and Arab Muslims in parliament for the first time. Um, yeah, it's a government that would have included everything from far right pro settler Zionists, progressive leftists, pro Islamist Arabs, all of them sort of working together in this unity coalition, right? So he was sort of making a ham handed comparison to the January 6th uh, Capitol riot that I didn't quite understand. But he made this his basic point was that Hamas and Netanyahu, they don't really want things to change, right? Because they're trying to hold on to power, and that power is predicated on things not changing for the better. So that was his uh, that was his point, and I just thought it was it was notable. I'm not sure if you read that column or not. I did. It came out Sunday. I also found that Sunday. the January 6th comparison, I, I didn't totally get that. But yeah. what he said was really interesting. I want to quickly read the end of it, too. Um, he said, you know, I wish that um, any of this that's, gonna ha- that's happening right now would produce a profound rethinking by BB or Hamas, but I doubt it. For the last 12 years, Bibi's had one mission, to keep Hamas and the Palestinian Authority weak and divided so that he could come to the U.S. Uh, every year and say to Congress, oh gosh, I'd love to make peace, but we have no partner on the other side. The Palestinians are weak and divided. And for 12 years, Hamas has had one mission, to keep Netanyahu in power so Hamas and its backers in Iran could tell their naive supporters in Europe or on liberal college campuses in the media and in the Democratic Party that the problem is not Hamas, an Islamo-fascist organization without a shred of democratic fiber that is dedicated to destroying the Jewish state and imposing a Tehran-like Islamic regime in Palestine, but rather that terrible pro-settler Netanyahu government in Israel. Bibi and Hamas, they need each other. They understand each other. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And for a brief shining moment, it looked as though a different Israeli coalition might be coming together to break that cycle. It certainly would not have made peace overnight, but it might have at least begun a different dialogue, a real dialogue among all sides. 
really yeah. fascinating take on it. Uh, one quick thing, that Atlantic piece that I talked about yesterday, it was written by the former AP reporter and editor in mm -hmm. Jerusalem who talked about the inherent Israel, uh, anti-Israel bias in the reporting from the region that he right. had witnessed. Uh, I just want to mention, that was actually from a few years ago, 2014. It still provides some really interesting insight, um, but it was just, I wanted to give a heads up in full disclosure, it was showing up on their homepage and being shared, and I didn't even realize, so my fault. If uh, Had I seen that, I, I probably still would have mentioned yep. it, but I, I definitely would have mentioned that it was from 2014. It's tricky how they do that sometimes. The Times does that too. They sort of yeah. like resurface stuff from years ago without really making it clear. Anyway. I get still, why still, they do it because it. it was an interesting piece in understanding yeah. what's going on. But I think that the, I think news outlets need to do a better job to say, hey, this isn't what just happened. Like this didn't just come out. Um, and it also came out right when Israel had um, bombed the building right, in, yeah. where, where uh, the AP was in Gaza. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, what's going on here. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case on abortion rights that could dramatically change the right to an abortion under Roe v. Wade, just given how the court's six to three, um, it now has a conservative supermajority. The case involves a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy and has been blocked by lower courts under the precedent set in Roe which established a national right to abortion before fetal viability. The justices are expected to hear the case in the fall and issue a ruling next year. Carlo, um, this is huge. It is. Uh, it, it was a foregone conclusion, I think, but uh, here it is. You know, when pro-choice advocates were flipping out about um, McConnell ramming through Amy Coney Barrett right before the election when uh, Ginsburg died last fall, this is why. Um, this is probably the beginning of the end of Roe for, of uh, the precedent set in Roe, uh, because think about it, even if Chief Justice Roberts acts as the swing justice here, which he might, it would still go 5-4, um, barring something crazy happening, which is possible, right? You never really know until it happens. Uh, but it's important to note, this is not a direct challenge to Roe or to Casey, which is the 1992 uh, uh, precedent that, that upheld Roe, Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Um, but it's sort of the opening salvo in what's going to be a sustained attempt by the right to make abortion a state's rights issue, uh, which is going to effectively make it illegal in at least 20 states immediately, um, just because I think 20 states have trigger laws on the books where if uh, abortion is struck down by the Supreme Court, it automatically becomes illegal in those states, including Mississippi, where this uh, case is coming from. Um, so that's going to happen, I think, and it's going to sort of once more, it's going to be one of these other things that just turns us into sort of two different countries, um, which is one of the things I really worry about long term about the United States. Uh, but also, I just want to make this one point. The, this is the latest data I could find. It's from 2014, so it's a little bit outdated. 75 percent of women who get abortions in America live on $23,000 or less a year. 60 percent of them are women of color, and 20 percent of them have to travel more than 50 miles for care. This is one of those, whatever you think about abortion, this is sort of one of those issues that, be, that has become sort of like a, a, a cause celeb of like the liberals out here in Brooklyn and sort of like, you know, rich white women. But it's really, you know, this is about, it, it's a racial justice issue in a lot of ways. Reading the tea leaves just on the Supreme Court, it is notable that the court even deci decided to take the case, right? Because they, they yeah. get presented tons of cases, and most they decide not to take. So they could have yeah. just let the lower court ruling stand. So the fact that they decided to take it means that perhaps these justices have more to say and want to weigh in. The thinking, though, um, is that maybe Brett Kavanaugh, um, surprisingly, mm -hmm. could join with John Roberts as this sort of block of swing votes, which has happened with some other decisions. Like Brett Kavanaugh is turning in and John Roberts are turning into those, both of them, swing votes. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, keep an eye on, what did you say, Carla? Uh, no, I just said I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but it's, I, I, I see your point, yeah. Uh, we'll see. Keep an eye uh, on your bank account starting July 15th. That is when the IRS will be distributing the first expanded child benefits passed as part of President Biden's stimulus package to about 39 million American families. The direct cash payments, $300 per child under six and 250 per child age six to 17 for qualifying families will come via direct deposit uh, on or around the 15th of each month through the end of the year. 
This benefit tapers off for single parents with incomes above 75K or couples making 150K, but you can still get uh, a $2,000 cash benefit if you make up to $400,000 a year as joint filers, just FYI. Also, this is important here. 17-year-olds are included uh, for the first time. Usually these these benefits can only go to 16 and under. So if you have a 17-year-old, you're going to get a couple bucks from them for once, since usually it's probably the other way <laughs> the around. Other right? way around. <laughs> uh, if you need to update your info with the IRS, just to make sure that you're uh, getting this money, if you qualify for it, they're going to launch an online portal soon. So keep you updated on that. Democrats have said that they want to make this cash payment uh, permanent. It's not clear how or if they're going to be able to do that. But as a general rule, once a social safety net benefit exists, it is very, very hard to get rid of it. And all you have to do is look over to Obamacare uh, to see how that works. Okay, the Warner Media Discovery merger that we talked about yesterday, now a done deal. AT&T is now out of the content game for good, spinning off its media properties into a new joint venture with Discovery. It isn't clear if they're going to merge Discovery Plus with HBO Max or keep the two streaming platforms separate. Um, but, Carlo, this is really a play for scale here. Um, as you noted, it's, it's to compete with Amazon, Disney, Netflix. Those yeah. are the big names when it comes to content. Yeah, Jill, look, we're in the uh, midst of a big media consolidation here. Uh, there's rumors in The Hollywood Reporter floating around yesterday that NBC Universal wants to acquire Viacom CBS. That would be huge. Hard, hard to imagine how that would possibly pass antitrust uh, scrutiny, having two of the three remaining big networks combined. But that's the rumor. And Variety reporting this morning that Amazon has made a $9 billion offer to buy the Hollywood studio MGM. Uh, so, you're just going to see more of this happening. And for the record, um, Discovery says they don't plan on spinning off CNN, uh, which has been a big rumor in our sort of uh, circles after this happened yesterday. Right. And what happens to Jeff Zucker? Because his contract is, is up pretty soon. So yeah, it will be fascinating to watch. Incredible that Amazon Prime, um, their their content and their, their, their channel or whatever you want to call it, that actually began, if you could believe it, as just a perk for, for Prime subscribers. Yeah. That's all that was. It was just like an extra little thing sprinkled yeah. in besides free shipping and 24-hour and right. service. Uh, and now it's a Hollywood studio. I mean, who, who would have ever it's thought crazy. even five years ago? It's now, it's one of my go-to streamers, I'd say. I'd say it's like the first ones I check are HBO Max, uh, what's the other one, Hulu and Amazon Prime. It's all a little too much for me. I, I think it's it's just there's too many. There's, there has to well, be yeah. a better system and some sort of consolidation yeah. <laughs> or a way to just organize it because it's it's hard to figure out where these shows it are. Is. How do you get them? Yeah. Um, I always like I, I see a show out there. I'm like, this looks interesting. And then I completely forget about it. And then I sort of like remember it. And I'm like, I forget what the show's called. So I don't know where I'm going to find it. Like there's no you're right. There's no like organizing like principle behind it. Right. Well, my husband's very good at bookmarking. He he yeah. thrives in this type of environment, and he's very <laughs> good at taking these shows, putting them into different folders. And like, I, whenever oh, I say I don't know what really? to watch, he's like, "I made you a folder. Go watch what's in the folder." Oh wow, we got to get Mike on here and have yeah. him do a little tutorial for us. Um, Apple, meanwhile, bringing high fidelity, lossless audio to Apple Music's entire catalog starting next month at no additional cost for subscribers. The premium audio allows you to hear music in a wider dynamic range, basically as it was intended to be heard in the studio by the artist. Lossless audio is noticeable if you are a true audiophile listening via high quality wired headphones in a quiet place. But for uh, the way most of us listen to music, it'll, it will likely be hard to tell the difference. Yeah, it is really hard to tell the difference. It's especially true because Apple even admitted that AirPods, AirPods Pro and AirPods Max, they can't even support this technology because of the Bluetooth codecs that they use, which I thought was really interesting because it's like I'm pretty sure that's how most people listen to music now is via their um, – their headphones. Uh, Spotify, by the way, also prepping a hi-fi format to debut later this year, um, which is just a great reason for us to also rem remind people that I'm still working on our Spotify summer playlist that will be out before Memorial Day, I promise you. And as I was working on it the other day, have you, you use Spotify, right? Mm -hmm. They've redesigned the entire app and it's so confusing. I'm it's glad like, you mentioned this. Have we discussed this? No, it's terrible. Oh, I'm so God. glad you mentioned it. It is just a classic example of of an over-engineered, like, 
it was totally fine the way it was. I knew where everything was. They read, they do these things, and it, I don't understand it for the life of me. I feel like Apple is the only company that does a good job of like read, like making incremental advancements in software that actually like work intuitively. Everybody else does it, and you're just like, oh, okay, well, I guess I just never find that again, <laughs> right? You know, I'm glad that you mentioned that about Spotify because I was. I had that in my notes to mention as well. So they've revamped, I, I don't know about the music, but they've revamped their podcasting. And for yeah. anyone who's listening to us on, on Spotify podcasts, it is to the point where I have to search for podcasts yeah. that are already should be in my library and coming up as yeah. new. Um, I don't really understand it. And then I'll there's a pin that says new episodes and then you hit it, but it isn't new episodes. I, I right. don't. I, I'm utterly confused to the point where I have thought I might get rid of Spotify and just go over to Apple. Wow! Like it, because wow. to me, I spot uh, podcasts are have become such a big part of the way I get news and information, um, and and I just. I can't deal with this disorganization in my life. <laughs> <laughs> my head is already crazy. Um, uh. And finally, Carlo, we like to keep uh, hip to the trends out there. If you ask any Starbucks barista what their biggest complaint is these days, you are likely to get the same answer. It is the explosion in complicated custom drink orders. Starbucks employees have been taking the social media to show some of the more ridiculous orders that they get with the customization list often going into the double digits. Two trends are colliding. The huge rise in mobile ordering brought on by the pandemic where customizations are actually encouraged and customers might feel less embarrassed about asking a barista to do so much extra work. Plus TikTok, where Starbies influencers are now a new genre unto themselves. I watched some of these Starbies influencers videos yesterday. It's like, oh my God, sometimes I worry about this, the state of this country. Um, but uh, this is, so this was a story in BuzzFeed over the weekend that I thought, but every once in a while BuzzFeed just really like does a great piece of something that like on something that like you never would have thought about but totally makes sense and the mobile ordering thing really makes sense right because like you would never I feel like I would never have the gall to like walk into a Starbucks <laughs> and ask them for like a venti cappuccino or, or with you know 20 different things but if you're just doing it on the app you're like boom 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 okay this is what I want although you and have the, the gall issue. Carlo to walk into a Starbucks in without, without a mask, mask before yeah, right. we're doing that right. in New York yeah you're <laughs> right, so who am I to talk? Um, by the way, Starbucks now selling more ice drinks than hot drinks. I thought that was really interesting, uh, given that they're a coffee company. Um, but as a disgraced former barista, I can tell you that uh, custom drink orders are truly the worst. It is like doing, you feel like you're doing like alchemy and like Greco Ro Roman Egypt or something. And it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just not good enough at it, but uh, I hated when people would come in and be like, okay, I need a cappuccino, but I need it uh, skim, half calf, and with uh, cinnamon, cinnamon and blah, blah, blah. So I could, t so I'm not a Starbucks drinker, but I could take two sides of this argument. If you are going to pay what's probably like $7 for a coffee, yeah, you should you be want, able right? to get it how you want it. And that's the whole point that they're even going in and not making the coffee at home, I, I would guess. However, I'm surprised there's not shame, forget from the baristas, but even from other people online, just like, okay, so I guess we're going to be here a while. You know, if you're behind someone who, who oh, that's their God. order, you, you probably yes. want to kill them. All the more reason why mobile ordering, it makes it easier, right? Because I think a lot of these places, not just Starbucks, but I think a lot of these places now have dedicated staff mm -hmm. that just pump out the mobile orders. But yeah, if the guy in front of me is ordering some insane drink, <laughs> that's an immediate just you know i'll i'm, I'm doing battle with that guy <laughs> all right um okay we're gonna leave it there that is what you need to know for tuesday may 18th have a great one guys